Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice. Today on the show, we've got returning guest, the one, the only. <laughs> Say it, Alan, who? Bob Beasley himself. <laughs> ah, himself. <laughs> we, we had so much fun doing the Gary Moore show with you, and then, of course, the Ozzy. We, we had to have you back to complete the trilogy. And, and so, when, yeah. when we brought it up at the end of our last interview, you said, yeah, sure. So we'll take full advantage of that. I, first things first, let's just talk charity for a moment. The Metal Hall of Fame All-Stars uh, with producer Neil Kernan, uh, Bob Daisley on bass, uh, Tony McAlpine, who everybody knows, Mike Torelli on vocals, and of course, studio drummer and founder, Patches Waldo, who was playing drums, and Derek Sherinian from Dream Theater. They all came out with a song called Attack of the Witch. And Bob, you played on it. Maybe you want to just talk about this briefly. No, I was glad to do it because it was for a good cause to help um, <clears throat> children, you know, that uh, need special uh, requirements and things so it was it was good for me I mean I felt good to do it you know it's just <clears throat> but you know good song and a good project and I was glad to be involved all right attack of the witch on Bandcamp. you can purchase it for I think it's a dollar and uh, for a good cause for special needs kids and uh, the dad founder Patches Waldo who put all that together congrats to him so Alan you want to start things off Hey, I just want to say, I finally got my hands on the Holy Grail, which is, for fact's sake, written <laughs> by talking. none other than Bob Daisley. It's a massive book. It's so big. It was it so is. good, I had to lend it to Jimmy to, to oh, okay. read, because it's one of the best biographies, autobiographies I've read in a long, long, long time. Oh, great. Glad to hear it. Yeah, it's, it's got great reviews. I mean, people are loving it. If you look at the reviews on... Amazon and <clears throat> places like that. It's it's uh, that you know they love it. They're giving it five stars, which is great. Great to see. Uh, you know, we talked about the Aussie years. We talked about the Gary Moore years. But let's go a little bit since it's the anniversary of Eternal Idol by Black Sabbath. Let's talk a little bit about Black Sabbath and the making of Eternal Idol and how you first got involved with Tony Iommi to uh, you know participate on the album. <clears throat> well, I got a call from the producer, Jeff Glicksman, who I'd, I'd worked with with Gary Moore. I think the first thing that I ever did with Gary was um, with uh, Jeff Glicksman producing his album. So uh, Jeff and I knew each other <clears throat> well. And um, out of the blue, I got this call and Jeff Glicksman was in uh, Montserrat in the West Indies doing the, um, the Black Sabbath album. That was the Eternal Idol had some time I was still working with Gary Moore and uh, I had some time off and, and Jeff said do you fancy doing a Sabbath album I said well I've, you know I've got a bit of time off and so I had a you know a chat with uh, Patrick Meehan Jr who was the manager of Black Sabbath at that time and uh, so we um, you know we agreed on some terms and I, I think I, I flew out with you know within a day or so I just just got out there, and it was. Um, I'd never really worked with with Tony before, but I, you know, Tony's great. I love his his playing, his writing, his sound. I mean, ev ev everything that he plays is a classic riff. You know, it's like <laughs> they're just pouring out of him, and and they're <laughs> not just sort of throwaway riffs. They're they're all like really really good uh, valid riffs, and and you know, to build songs around those riffs, it was. Um, you know, it, it was great for me, and I, I enjoyed it. That was 1986. Yeah, <coughs> time flies. Time flies. Yeah, and I, I, I did. I didn't. Eric Singer was on drums. Yep. And Eric and I got on very well. And Ray Gillen was was the vocalist. And you know, we all got on fine together. I, I remember the very first day I went in. I was probably still a bit jet lagged. I'd only been there. I got in the night before. <clears throat> and um, I said to Jeff Glicksman, well, play me the track, but without bass, because I think some of the tracks already had bass on them from Dave Spitz. And Dave Spitz had to go home to, he had to go back to America to deal with whatever it was he had to deal with. I think some personal issues or something. And uh, so I was um, going to play on all the tracks. <clears throat> so I, I got Jeff Glicksman to play me a track 
uh, and I said, without bass, and I just had a listen, and then I played what I thought would suit the track. Tony Iommi came in, and Jeff Glixman played him what I'd just done, and he just looked at Jeff Glixman. Tony looked at uh, Jeff and just said, yep, yeah, that's great. Just, you know, give him a free hand, let him do whatever he wants, and walked out. <laughs> you know that was great for me to um you know to hear that from tony that he, he, he i just did one track love what it did and gave me a free reign yeah and and gillen ray gillen you know uh you meet him he did you write the lyrics yeah, together yeah. with him or did he already get a song <clears> on well it? ray had some scratch lyrics written and and i think a couple of the others had sort of put bits in or or whatever but a lot of them weren't that great i, I wouldn't say they were world class so um they asked me to write the lyrics for the songs which i did and and so, so there's you know there's some lines that i left in there that, of, of rays and and that you know but um that was yeah that that, that was just a sort of um this is with the bonus, by the way. This is the bonus. Yeah, it's funny because there's two versions of it. There, there's one with Ray Gillen singing and, and one with um, That's Tony right. Martin. That's right. And, and let yeah. me tell you, the songs with Ray Gillen, right, Alan? You've heard them. They, yeah. they, they, they're, they're like of good quality. I mean, they're like a step oh, above. Oh, sure. It, yeah, it wasn't demo. He was he was doing the vocals. And, and I think because <clears throat> Ray left, or I, I don't know the – full circumstances because I wasn't with the band at that point but when Ray left <clears throat> or the, and, you know I don't know if there was a fallout or what happened between him and management or Tony or, or whatever it was um, but his vocals had already been recorded but but they didn't use him because they knew that they were replacing him with Tony Martin so they got Tony to redo everything and, and release it that way. And it was, and it went for years and years without anyone hearing the the, the Ray Gillen. You see, Ray, they were Ray Gillen's melodies and phrasing, and and that's what um, you know comes from Ray's heart. So Tony did a great job, admirable job of of replacing what Ray had done. But the initial thing came from Ray. So you know, I think when you hear Ray's version, it's it's like the version. In in the book, you make allusions to why you didn't stay inside with you or thought their management was a little dodgy at the time. And and you know what? In Tony Iommi's great uh, autobiography as well, he confirms that. And yeah. in fact, he says here that the reason why Ray left was nobody was getting paid. Me, me and wasn't paying anybody. Yeah, yeah. I did get paid. That's good. But That's I was good. wary of the whole situation because I knew – that everyone was unhappy. And I thought, well, you know, why go into a situation like that? Plus I was very happy with working with Gary Moore and, you know, I, I didn't really want to leave Gary, you know, to, I mean, to, to join Sabbath, it, it would have been an honor, but, you know, a great band, great name. And Tony Iommi and I got on great together really well, you know, and I love the music and, and, and it, it would have been artistically, it would have been nice to be able to do, you know, to be a, a member of the band, but everything seemed a bit unstable, a bit shaky and a bit, you know, there, there wasn't any sort of definition to everything. And so I was wary of the whole thing. And, and <clears throat> as was just said, Tony confirms it in his book as well. You know. Was it like the vision of Tony to say, okay, we're getting out of the doom business and we're going more into the eighties you know, big sound and, and more glossy. It was that like the direction of the band or just it naturally came out the way it came out? I think it just naturally came out. the way. There was no sort of um, plan or, or, or definite sort of let's, let's try to sound this way or that way or whatever. I think everybody just played and, and wrote and performed and was recorded, you know, at, just in a natural progression sort of thing you know I, I i don't think it was um you know it was like when we went in the studio with the blizzard of oz you know it wasn't like oh how, what can we write how can we have a hit record we just went in did what we did what we loved and did it the you know the best way that we could and we thought because at that time in, in the 80s um you know that there was the disco and the punk thing and the and the new wave and all that, that and where people were actually trying to jump on the bandwagon and have hit singles or hit records or whatever but we didn't do any of that it was just 
do what you do, do it as well as you can, and and if they like it, they like it. I, I, to be honest with you, I, I think that Sabbath album, <clears throat> The Eternal Idol, is is underrated, and and it's actually a very good album. Yeah, we'll show it again. I got the, <laughs> of, of, of course, of course, of course, I have. You know, I I did purchase the the one with Ray Gillen and Tony Martin. It's it's when you said the melody was built by Ray Bill, Ray Gillen, it's so true because Tony Martin, you could see a great voice. Don't get me wrong, but you could see. Oh no, he did a great job. He's basically he singing did. the same way Ray Gillen is singing, you know. And yeah, and sometimes it's hard to even tell them apart. At, at, at sometimes, you know, when you're listening to the album. Yeah, well, maybe he tried to recreate what yeah. Ray had done a little bit because. I think Tony was happy with what Ray had done and, and it really suited the band, suited the music, suited the album. And I think possibly that um, Tony was trying to recreate what had already been done. Yeah. 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 Alan. No. And again, uh, you know, you spoke in the, in the book uh, about your mom, how she was kind of blessed with uh, foresight. And I, and here's a good case of you uh, kind of, inheriting that gene and seeing how it would play out <laughs> at that time with Sabbath. And it was probably a good thing to, to, to leave with the, with the management situation. So. Yeah, I, th I, I think so. It's, it's, it's all, sometimes it's just down to a gut feeling of which way to go. You know, my mum was, was, you know, gifted, a gifted psychic. And she was, and she was so accurate. And I probably do have a little bit of that, you know, things come to me and, and, uh, and quite often, you know, they're accurate, but I can't do it at will like she could. <laughs> she could sit down and do a reading sort of thing. And she was just spot on. I don't know if I should talk about this or maybe we should leave it for people to read in the book, but the Ouija board, I was kind of, uh, I was kind of taken back by that at the Randy Rhodes years. Uh, oh, when we were down at Monmouth. Yeah, and you, and you did the Ouija board with Randy. I don't know if I want to leave that, you know, not talk about that in the teaser for your book or if you want to speak to that very high level or I don't know if you can. Um, well, you know, we, we were sort of <laughs> – that place was um, reputed to be uh, haunted, the Monmouth um, Rockfield rehearsal place. And it probably was, you know, I'd, uh, uh, and, you know, there were little things that happened and, and I've written about them in the book, but um, I, th I think one night we were just in that mood. We thought we'll, we'll, we'll sit down and um, have a, have a seance. And, and we did the, the letters and numbers with the glass and all that. And some things came out and it did, you know, I, I go into detail in the book, but it, it did say things to Randy that freaked us all out. Because uh, we th we we threw all the bits of paper with the letters and numbers in the fire and broke the glass and poured salt on the table and that because it was not a good vibe and it was not good news and it was not a good prediction. It was pretty awful. You know, it's, um, anyway, so if that. everybody, you got to read the book to truly get the <laughs> yeah. details of this seance, this premonition of sorts. And we're not going to get into details because I want people to read the book and I want people to buy the book. But sure. Yeah. What I, what I took away from the book is first of all the vernacular you're using. It's like just three of us talking in the book with all the expressions, the expressions your father used to use. Oh, they yeah. were just hilarious, and and it was just a set of circumstances. Bob, you you were just like so many times the right place at the right time. It's oh, it's just certainly. an amazing career when you when you look back at it. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It's. You know that that that's part of the whole thing is being in the right place at the right time to connect, and and uh, you know, I've been very fortunate in working with so many you know gifted people, um, you know, or, or there's some great guitar players, great drummers, great singers, and great situations, you know, and it's uh, it's been an honor for me, and I feel grateful for my um, good fortune, you know. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any other artist who's who's actually played with all the greats like you have. Um, so so now we have the the 40 year anniversary of. Uh, we're gonna jump back and forth. It just and we'll keep <laughs> sure, it very sure. high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and feel free to answer or not answer, and, and it's all good. You know, uh, I don't want right. to touch over some legal issues or anything like that. So right. We have the Diary of a Madman. I think it's the 40 year anniversary. Uh, the re yeah. is flying high. So I'm watching a video and this is just me, Bob. I'm watching a video yep. and I go, where's Bob in the video? And 
and and and and I'm trying to understand. You know, like it looks like it's just an Aussie song, and of course Randy's there, which he with all he's got to be there, of course. Of course. But but for the people out there who don't realize, tell us about the writing of "Flying High" again, and and just how it came about, and who contributed to that song. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, well, yeah. well, Lee died um, in September last year. So in September of this year, um, I put up a, sh- a short snippet of some of the recordings that I have um, of our writing sessions and rehearsal sessions. I, I didn't record them for any other reason uh, than to have a, a you know a, a reference to work to because sometimes you would you would uh, you know write a piece and you say oh we'll remember that tomorrow but quite often you don't so I I recorded everything so we wouldn't, wouldn't forget anything and um, on that particular day you'll you'll hear the recording on my website um, and it's of Lee singing the original vocal melody um, to fly and high because it was just the three of us there. It was Randy, Lee, and me. And um, Randy had the main riff. Um, I contributed musically with Randy with changes in the song. Then Lee came up with the basic vocal melody, uh, which probably would have been maybe, you know, enhanced or, you know, added to later. But when it came to the lyrics, I wrote all the lyrics and, and came up with that title. Um, and it was from, there's a story in the book you may yeah. remember that um, when I was just a young lad, I think it was about 19, and I was in the country here in um, Australia in a country town. And after the, and it was in the 60s, so th- this, this sort of old leather faced um, country bloke came up to me and he said, Oh, he's going to be going back down to Sydney town. You'd be flying high again. He was, he was, um, you know, assuming that <laughs> because we dressed in flowered shirts and fringe jackets and high heel boots and little sunglasses that, that we're all on drugs. And, and it sort of stuck in my mind, you know, that, that, um, that little episode. So that's, that's kind of where I got the, uh, it was him, his, his, um, words that, that uh, formed the title of the song and that was uh, yeah so, so you can hear you can hear the original version on my website um it was just a snippet of it. it's only like 40 45 seconds of it or something that's, that's what you can legally play of of something that's um <clears throat> not not as you know um published and signed and and all the rest of it but uh i think that'll answer your question if you hear that Okay. Well, I mean, so I, I take my takeaway is you wrote, uh, Lee wrote the melody, you wrote the lyrics, arrangements, and Randy wrote the music. I guess. Well, I did, Randy didn't write all the music. And that, and that's quite often the, the mm-hmm. thing with, with some of the stuff with Randy. He did most of the songs, he came up with the basic um, riffs and the idea of it. Some of them, all of it. Um, mm-hmm. And I usually wrote the lyrics, but some of the music and that, that I, I co wrote with Randy. <clears throat> no no and again uh, you know going back uh, in your youth like you said uh, man to be you can be hospitalized for having long hair back in the day we you know you look around the world today people have got the you know different colors uh, hair the nose rings oh, yeah. everything and back in the day yeah. if your hair went down slightly past your ear you can you can be sent off to uh, reform school almost Oh, so we got the shit kicked out of us a couple of times by thugs, you know, for just be having slightly long hair, and and that in those times, and I'm talking sort of early to mid '60s, we were kind of like the pioneers of 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 that state. It wasn't just a fashion either; it was a social statement. To grow your hair long was a statement, and it was like you know, it, it was a kind of um, anti-establishment statement sort of thing. And so I guess it frightened some people, you know, but um, I got kicked out of high school because of it. I refused to wear school uniform and get my hair cut. And it wasn't that long. It was just collar length, you know, but it was, it was my personal statement, you know, and, and there were a couple of times that we got really badly bashed up for, um, for looking different and being different and daring to make that statement, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, another part that I, I was a little surprised I knew about, but I didn't know about, it was Steve Vai's 
you know, he joined Ozzy for a time. Yeah. Uh, I, I never, I, ne- I knew about it high, really high level, but I never really knew about it. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit and you contributing with him. Well, that was an honor as well. And that was great. You know, it was, um, it didn't work. It didn't really work out between Ozzy and Steve Vai for, for whatever reasons. I don't, I don't know the, um, you know, the full details, but I remember I, I, I was at, um, I was at home and I got the phone call. Will you come and, um, you know, play co-write on the next album? And, you know, I, I love the idea of working with Steve Vai and Ozzy together and, <clears throat> so we went to Steve Vai's studio in LA and um, began, uh, you know, I was putting down tracks with, with Steve on, on some of the stuff and that. And then, and then we went to New York uh, and began uh, writing and rehearsing in the, um, the Sony studios in New York. But, th- but then all of a sudden it all fizzled out and the plug was pulled and it was like, no, it's not going to happen. But um you know, did, did, I, I did, have. Did the songs live hate. on? No, did the songs live on in Osmosis? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think some of them did. I, I, I really can't remember what songs were there. I, I've got, I've got some recordings from those sessions of, and it's mostly just me, Steve Vai, and and the drummer who was Dean Castronovo, a yeah. very good drummer, and um, and and it was, you know, it was it, it clicked. It was it was working well. But um, you know the whole thing as an overall project didn't didn't really work out. So um, uh, right. St- Steve wasn't in that any, anymore, and that was the end of that. But you know it was fun to do at the time. I, I remember when I got to Steve's studio, they they had been using another bass player. I, I can't remember who it was or anything much about him really. But but I remember Steve saying Steve told me himself. He said they they were asking this bass player, whoever it was in the studio, uh, try to sound like Bob Daisley. What would he do here? Play <laughs> like that. Until it got to the point where Steve Vai just said, "Why don't we get the real one over here?" You know, and that's that's why I was asked to go and do it. So try to write the lyrics like Bob Daisley. Try to write the lyrics like Bob Daisley. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was more the playing side of things of, you know, what would he play here? What would he do? How would he, you know, that, that sort of thing. And, uh, but you, you, you can never really recreate something that someone else does. You, you can play a bit like their style or, or, or play what you might think that they might play there or whatever, but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's just, there's, it, there's only one of whoever it is, you know, and, you know, I've been asked that question many times of well, all those different guitar players you played with, who's the best? Well, there is no best. There's the best for a situation. Yeah. You know, Richie Blackmore was the best guitarist in Rainbow. Randy Rose was the best guitarist in the Blizzard of Oz. Yeah. You know, yeah. Gary Moore was the best guitarist in the Gary Moore band. It's, it's kind of like that. Yeah. 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 Um... One of the things I was reading the book and it, it's really your friendship with Ozzy and, and then Sharon comes in, and, but it's, you know, okay, this happened and then this happened and I didn't get paid there. And, and I'm, I'm seriously, geez, Bob's such a nice guy. He's giving them a third, fourth, fifth chance. But then I found myself towards the end of the book saying, Bob, stop, stop. Uh, Don't go down that road. You know how it's going to end. So yeah, just, it, 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 I, I don't know your comments about how you were so like good hearted and always giving them a, a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh chance sometimes. <laughs> well, it does come across like that, but it was quite a complicated situation. It was never black and white of, of like, you know, it, it, it does get complicated with, with the, with the overall going back and forth and some of the legal issues with with Jet Records and with with Don Arden, the you know the father and um, and and the more you read into it, you get to understand you know the, the complications and why I kept on going back and and what happened. Yeah, um, I, I agree. But I with did that, live Bob. in hope, yeah. and I did give the benefit of the doubt, and I and I did want it to, you know, work out, but it didn't. 
I, Bob, I'm going to say something. I think yeah. giving people the benefit of the doubt and, and always looking for the best in people is always the better way to go in life. Of course. And, and I think that's what you, you were doing. You're saying, I like this. I enjoy this. And I hope these people could turn around, you know, and, and you know, appreciate who I am. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, no, it's, it's you've tried to do the right thing, even if you get shit on or what right. doesn't okay. work out or whatever. But at, at least if you've tried to do the right thing, then then that's the main point. Absolutely. And, you know, what? you got to play with so many great people because of that, you know, the offshoots yes. of all that. Right. So there's yeah. so much more. Um, another. So we talked to Carmine, a piece or apathy, whichever the name yeah. is. And well, his, and, and his, <laughs> well, yeah, um, Any his, Carmine yeah, Peace. Well, Any yeah, they just they both went with the pronunciation of their yeah, name that, that most that. people called them. You know, most people called it Vinny Apice and Carmine Peace. Yeah. I mean, the real pronunciation in Italian, which is an Italian name, is Apice. Apice. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, so yeah. on Bark at the Moon. All right. And this yeah. is what Carmine tells me, you know, because, yeah. you know, Carmine was part of it at the end. Tommy Aldridge. Well, yeah, they, he didn't really play any drums on it, though. He says he came in and he fixed it. Were you there like at the at the mastering yeah. stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much did so Tommy plays? They want Tommy. They want Tommy. They put Tommy on the album. Then Carmine comes in to fix it all up. I mean, what's the but story he didn't there? Fix it all up. It's all Tommy. You know, it's, Tommy played on that album. You, Tommy's, you know, forte really is his live stuff. His live mm -hmm. performance is great, and he's still great in the studio. He's still a, you know, a, a good drummer, but he gets a little bit sort of, um, oh, I don't know, um, intimidated. Being in the studio, it, it rattles him a little bit, I think, and sometimes, you know, he takes longer than, than you know some other people might and um and it was i know it was taking a long time when we were at ridge farm to get the drum tracks down and uh you know the the powers that be were getting a bit rattled about that and uh but you know the thing is once it was done it was done it was in the can it was tommy on them it, it, it should have been just okay let's go on the road and take tommy because his forte really is playing live um, but instead, Tommy was ousted and they got Carmine in. Now, Carmine's another great drummer, yeah. but I couldn't see the point of shutting the gate after the horse got out, if you, if you know what I mean. And that's what it seemed like to me. But um, yeah. right. it didn't work out with Carmine anyway because th there was a personality clashes and this clash and that clash and they got Tommy back and, <laughs> you know. But Carmine didn't really do much on the album. You know? He says he touched it up. It wasn't it was like just, he re-recorded yeah. the album or anything. No, 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 no. I think they, they brought him in to sort of tweak stuff. That's what he was saying. He was tweaking Tommy's uh, drum sound at the end. I don't I don't know what he did exactly, but that's what he was saying. Mm. Well, I, that's what he said. I Carmine was on the tour for, well, the English tour and Scandinavia, and then, then we went to America, and then that's when things started falling apart and they got uh, Tommy back. Is, is it true that he was asked to leave after they found uh, selling his t-shirts at an Ozzy Osbourne concert? They had mm -hmm. Carmen a piece t-shirts being sold and that's why he was asked to leave. Is there any truth in that? Uh, it was a combination of things really. I think it was um, well see he had a contract and in his contract it, it I mean I didn't see the contract it was just I'm just going on what he told me he said he had a contract with where he was um he got the okay to do uh, clinics on the afternoons of some of the shows so he would go along and do his drum clinics and fans would come along pay and and he would you know teach them and show them things and <clears throat> and he also had a his own little uh, merchandising stand that, that he sold t-shirts and sticks and badges and whatever else. Um, and I think it kind of got up the nose of <laughs> those at the top. And uh, yeah, it, I, I, you know, I, I didn't like the way it was handled, but it, that, that wasn't for me to um, judge or do anything about. So all, all of a sudden he was gone and Tommy was back. So, on the what, when we it. saw the Bark at the Moon tour, Alan, who was who was on bass and who was on drums? Was Bob? Were you in Montreal, Canada? Did you play there? Yeah, or? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I did the whole world tour with the Bark at the Moon. So JT was Lee and Okay. Some of it was Carmine, and then the, the last bits were with Tommy. I can't remember who was. You were on bass, so I was like right there up front. I, I think, I think, if I, I remember it as Tommy being on drums. Yeah, and Bob okay. was on base. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then okay. there was this little, like, small person who used to bring up, a, a, had a pillow, and he brought it to Ozzy every few oh, songs. Oh, that was Tony. Yeah. Yeah, but what was that pill he was taking? It was like a salt pill or something. It was very peculiar, because I was standing right front stage there, watching, and, and there was this, like, this pillow he was bringing him. Nobody could answer my question. I've asked Carmine this. I've asked everybody. This. Oh, what was, on, what was on the pillow? What was on the pillow? There was, like, a little pill. Like, I was standing right there, and I don't know what he was... Maybe it was a salt pill. Maybe it could have been. I, I don't know. I mean, Ozzy didn't do drugs or drink. No, I didn't think on stage. on stage. No, no, no. Um, so I, I really don't know. What right, I'm still not that answered that. the question. I still can't figure <laughs> yeah. out. All these years. Is it true that when you're on the Molly crew, um, the bus at the Molly crew, they're even... I mean, were they nice guys? Were, and then, you know... And then I oh, they were great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 I mean, they were wild boys. You know, but but as you know, that they, we got on great together. You know, I, I, sometimes one or two of them would go on our bus, and sometimes some of us would go on theirs. Are you going to ask me about the Mick Mars? Thing? Yeah, were you the power <laughs> broker in keeping Mick Mars? You were the power right. broker here, right? <laughs> the voice of well, reason. Um, that night um, after the show, Mick went on our bus with Ozzy and. And that, and I went on their bus. So I was the only one of our lot that went on their bus. And they were having a meeting um, about. Um, I asked Vince Neil, is it could, at, at the time? I, he came out here with with uh, Motley Crue, and I went to the show and 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 saw them, and it was was great to see him again. That was a few years back now. And I I said to Vince, I said, look, you know, is it okay for me to say in my book about that night? you know with with the mick mars when i was on your bus he said yeah that's he, he said he probably even knows about that now but what they were planning doing was getting rid of mick and getting another guitarist in and they asked me for my opinion so i said well if you want my opinion for what it's worth i would say do not try to fix something that's not broken yeah. I said, I've seen it before with Lee Kerslake in the blizzard of Oz. You know, it's, uh, I said, you got a chemistry there. You're going to, you know, a functioning unit. Mix, Mick Mars is part of that. Don't, don't fuck it up. You know, um, that's my opinion. Just don't, don't do it. And I think I saved Mick's neck that night because they were getting serious about, you know, getting someone else. Probably mm -hmm. because he was, I mean, Mick was good for the band. He was part of the sound, part of the, um, you know, delivery of, of what they did. And and you, it'd be like sort of trying to replace Ringo in the Beatles with John Bonham or something, or Ginger Baker or, or somebody really, really technically brilliant. But yeah. it just wouldn't work. It wouldn't suit, you know. So sure. I said, no, leave it as it is. It's not broken. Stop, stop trying to fix it. So, you know, they left it alone and it worked out. Yeah. yeah, Mick. Mick was. Um, I think he was a few years older than them, and he was also. I mean, you wouldn't call Mick a virtuoso, a, a guitar hero, but he was great for the band. So yeah, I just and, said, and, you, know, you can read about it all here in the book. I leave it, and you can read about it all here. Oh, look at it. You, know, you know, actually, you want know, what really blew me away with this book was the pictures. It's like you used to take, you took so many pictures. Oh yeah. There's 380 like, look this. photos. Look at this. There. This is a massive book. Like this is like so heavy. My back hurts when I lift it. There's just so many pictures. You've detailed your life and all the events and all the, from the roads to Gary Moore to, you know, to the later years. It's just amazing yeah. how many pictures you took. Well, I, you know, I took a lot of photos um, and I also kept a diary, but I also have a very good memory, you know, so I can, I can remember things very well. And, and, and quite often I, I would just consult the diary to see what happened and when and that. And it's, and then I've got all the dates and the days and who was there and which is why it's called for fact's sake, because it's all factual. Yeah. Like I said, it was it's such a great read. I had to lend Jimmy the book, and I knew he would enjoy it thoroughly as well. So, so Bobby, oh, lends me the book. Like I read it. Original, that looks like a first edition copy. Yes, you've got I think so. But there's no they signature. made it in. They, they made a hardback version not long oh, really? after that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Oh, I lucked out then. All right. So, so okay, settle this. And the now. hardback versions or the later ones, the only thing I changed was I added to the epilogue at the mm-hmm. end when things like, and when, oh, so-and-so has died or this has happened or this development came or whatever, you know. But the basics of, of the book remained the same without any changes. And uh, apart from, like, in the very first one, there was a couple of words that needed um, either replacing or correcting or spellings and things like that. There was a couple of typos and that. But <clears throat> the uh, the current one is a hardback with, with the added parts to the epilogue and that, just to bring it up to date. Yeah, no, it's great. So settle this now. Okay. So Frankie Benali, okay. you, Frankie Benali, who's been on the show says that he, and you know, rest in peace, Frankie. We love Frankie Benali. Uh, you know, is this the over one, the mountain? This is over the mountain. Now, yeah, Lee Kerslake, to do with it. that was Lee's. That was Lee's. Now Lee yeah. Kerslake was on the show too. And he said, no, that was mine. That was mine. Of course it was his. Where, where does kid. Frankie and again? I rest don't in peace, Frankie. He didn't even know who Frankie was. He'd never even heard Frankie play. You know, we'd probably heard the name from Randy um, in those times, but we, you know, we'd never heard anything that they'd done because they were virtually unknown anyway. I think they could only get a record deal in Japan as a sort of glam rock band but but um no when when lee came up with that if anything i would say it's got a slight influence from something that uh, ian pasted with deep purple but that's yeah. about all but it's still lee's i mean it's still his his thing it's no it's nothing to do with frank there were no like tapes that uh, randy brought no. with him no. because they said they jammed with ozzy in la then they went to england so there were no uh, tapes from your recollection. No, for no. facts, no, Randy got Randy nothing. got the gig in LA. Ozzy said, "You're in the band. You want the gig." But but yeah. when Ozzy came back to um, England, yeah. that was when I met him at a club in London called the Music Machine, mm-hmm. and he didn't even mention Randy was going to get another band together because he wa- that I think he and Jet Records wanted to base the whole band in England. So the the Randy thing went out the window. It was it was only when I went to Ozzy's place. And we had a knock together with with a couple of guys he had up there. It could have been the people that he had the first time when he left Sabbath in, I think, 77 or 78. And he got a couple of guys together and he was going to call the band the Blizzard of Oz then. But that didn't work out. And he went back to Sabbath. It could have been those guys. I don't know. But when I said to Ozzy, look, you know, I I love working with Ozzy. We got on great together straight away, immediately. And I said, I'd love to do that. This, but if you want to get serious, I don't think that the other two guys are really well. They're okay. They're nice guys, decent players and all that, but I don't think they're world class. So he went in and, and he, he said, pack up, fellas, go home. It's not working out. And that was it. They were gone. But that was when he told me about, he said, I, I met this other guitarist in, in LA called Randy Rhodes. I said, well, let's get him over here. And that's what happened. We went to David Arden at Jet Records and, David finally agreed because at first he said, no, he's unknown, he's young and this, that and the other. And and then eventually he said, okay, against my better judgment, and that was his words. I still remember his exact words. He said, against (laughs) my better judgment, I agreed to fly this young, unknown kid over. And that that was when the band began. But you're good friends with one of Alan's favorite singers of all time, Bon Scott. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, I knew Bond from the 60s here from the circuit. What was his personality yeah. like, like on a given day? Oh, lovely bloke. Heart of gold, lovely bloke. Real down to earth, real sort of rough nut street kid with a heart of gold and a real gentleman. Re- really nice bloke. I, that, that really affected me when he died because, um, well, the story about him dying and how I found out's in the book as well. It just, that, was, that was very sad. It was a right. sad way to find out exactly the way you wrote it in the book. It's a really sad way to find out. So. Yeah. Yep. 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 Hmm. Did you, did you play with Ozzy uh, and Iron Maiden at the Red Reading Festival? Was it when Paul Diano was in the band or was it Bruce just got into the band? Do you remember? Uh, at the Reading Festival. Yeah. The Reading. Yeah. Uh, no. Well, I think we were, the Blizzard of Oz was booked to do the Reading Festival festival that that first year which would have been well that would have been 1980 but we weren't ready to do it so we weren't actually on it unless you're talking about another one 
I saw a clip. Was, I saw it, a clip. was it the Lizard of Oz or the Blizzard of yeah, Oz? Yeah, There's a photo in the book. Right. They even got the name wrong yeah. because there's a picture of the poster in there. That's that's why I'm, I'm talking about, about the it. Lizard of Oz. The Lizard of Oz. Yeah. The Lizard of Oz. Yeah. You were on the bill. Maiden was on the bill. Yeah, but and, we didn't. Do it. But you didn't play, so that was just no. sort of like a poster of something that should have happened but didn't. Yeah, that didn't. Yes. Okay. All right. And when you played in the UK with the Blizzard of Oz. Yeah. Was there any film crews anywhere or no, nothing. 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 So there's no footage of us yeah. anywhere that I know of anyway. I, you know, at, at the time I I thought it would have been good to to actually get a crew in and film one of the shows. Yeah. But um but that didn't happen. You would think that with, you know, obviously coming from Sabbath and Sabbath being such a big name that his new band um, might be uh, filmed for you know for posterity or for whatever reasons, but nothing happened. They they did record a show with the mobile studio, <clears throat> and um, two yeah, of the tracks, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, "No Bone Movies" and "Goodbye to Romance," were used on the tribute album, tribute to Randy. Yeah. Uh, so that's not that band on that. That's us from the uh, from the first blues. Which they album. didn't pay you for. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Which they didn't pay you for. <laughs> yeah, or credit. credit. Or credit. Mm -hmm. Spend your whole life getting, you know, other people, other people sort of taking the credit for your work. Must be frustrating. Yep. Must be frustrating. Yep. But Alan, do you got anything? No, oh, no. I mean, uh, again, uh, you know, the way you built up your youth, the, the bands that were influencing you, uh, Rolling Stones, uh, Beatles, and then you have the chance to meet George Harrison years later when he came to visit his neighbor, Gary Moore, at one of Gary's shows. Yeah. And, and the way you just described that whole story in the book, it's he's so self-effacing. And, and you must have been shocked to realize you're talking to a live Beatle. Oh, I was gobsmacked. You know, it was it was I, I've always been a Beatles fan since they since I was like 13 or something getting ready for high school. And my mum had the radio on in the kitchen and she loves you came on. And my ears pricked up and I ran into the kitchen and turned the radio. I thought, God, what is this? And that was like, oh, this new band from England called the Beatles. And it's just amazing. And and you know, I was just so fascinated with with the whole energy thing the whole you know what was happening with that and to be able to and that was in by the 80s when when gary lived near george harrison <clears throat> um that george came to one of our shows and stood on my side of the stage for the whole <laughs> show about 10 foot away <laughs> so and then he came into the dressing room later and you know i shook his hand and that and that meant a lot to me but the way he was talking about this band that he used to be in, he said, oh, yeah, we used to play here. And I felt like saying, George, you're George Harrison, and the band you're talking about is the Beatles, you know. <laughs> I felt like giving him a slap. You know? <laughs> but it, it was very nice, you know. He was a real gentleman, lovely, lovely, gentle person. You know? But not only George Harrison and the Beatles, but Led Zeppelin. Right, you know, oh, yeah. plant. I mean, you you hung out with these guys, right? They're oh, your, yeah. they're like pals, right? And yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I well, guess... I, when I joined Chicken Shack in '72, um, I think the f uh, yeah, or well, actually no, it was when I was first staying with Clive Coulson in London in '72. That would have been July '72, and I was only there a couple of days. I'd just arrived. And the doorbell rang, and it was John Paul Jones. He, he bought a new car, and he said, oh, come out and have a look at my new car. Well, see, I was a major Zeppelin fan. I loved the band. You know, I loved what they were doing, that sort of heavy blues stuff. Anything blues orientated for me, I, I just loved. So we went out there, and I, I was in awe of him because he was such a great musician and the bass player of one of my favourite bands at that time, you know. And then when I joined Stan Webb with Chicken Shack, uh, in 72, that was 71 when, when I met um, John Paul Jones. And then in 72, after I joined Chicken Shack and Stan was up in his house in Kidderminster, which is near where uh, Robert and Bonzo lived, uh, there was a knock at Stan's door and it was John Bonham. He said, come out and have a look at my new car. In other words, he'd bought this Stingray. So there's a photo in the book as well with Bonzo with his new Stingray that he just had shipped over from America and that's it. You know, it all meant so much to me. You know, I'd go, I'd go up the pub in Kidderminster with with Stan, 
and I'll be standing at the bar and in would walk Robert Plant and stand with us and have a beer, you know. So pretty fascinating stuff for, a, you know, a, a young lad like me at the time being a Zeppelin fan, you know. I went to one of their rehearsals and even though they weren't there at that point, at that time, that I think the, the road crew were... Um, testing all the gear and had it all set up. So there was John Paul Jones's basses and these acoustic amplifiers and Pages Marshalls and the drum kit and all that stuff. And they're going through everything. And I and I got up and played John Paul Jones's basses, both of them, and through his gear. And that for me that meant a lot. Oh wow! I'm playing. I'm playing the basses that were on those uh, Zeppelin albums. And I think they only had. Yeah, they did. They only had three albums out at that point. They'd, they'd done the third album. But, yeah. you know, it, it all meant so much to me. Yeah. And, and you know what? We should also talk about depersonalization syndrome, the syndrome that you talk about throughout the book. And if you want to talk about it. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it, people it, can it, know it, about it, right? Oh, it's, well, see, when, when I was only 16 and it hit me, it was, it was, um, nobody knew. It was very difficult to explain because if you have it, and, and it is actually quite common. It's way more common than I ever, you know, imagined. But uh, as years went by and there was more research done on it and that, you know, there's the, they found out there's a lot more people have it and suffer from it than, than uh, you know, they thought. And, and at the time, I was trying to explain it's... Um, it, apparently, it's a brain function thing. So, it, it, and, it, and it can come from trauma, whether it be physical trauma, being bashed in the head, or emotional trauma by being very upset, or, or mental trauma by being, you know, mentally tortured or whatever. Well, I had sort of all three because I had a really bad spinal injury when I was 16, where, and your spine being sort of like an extension of your brain, of you with your <clears throat> spinal cord being attached to your brain. It was, it really affected me. Plus the band that I was in at the time broke up and that really affected me too. So I had, you know, the mental and emotional trauma of that plus the physical trauma. And, you know, um, I've had people write into the, my website after reading my book saying that they'd suffered from depersonalization as well. It's, it's an awful feeling. It, it, it really is and and nobody on the outside could tell just by looking at your your behavior that you were suffering from anything at all so it's um uh it's it you know it can make you very depressed as well just just the effects of it you know so my mum and dad took me to places and like you know analysts and psychoanalysts and psychiatrists and all the rest and they would tell me oh no you're depressed um, and and so it's causing this thing, and I'd say, no, you got the cart before the horse. You know, it's I'm depressed because I've got this this condition. I haven't got the condition because I'm depressed. I'm depressed because I've got the condition, and that was it. You know, so uh, I th think I go into it in a bit more detail in the book and how it happened and when. And but it was the inspiration for a lot of music too. So with bad comes good. Oh, right? sure. Right. You know, the sure. yin and the yang, right? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they say people like uh, Vincent, Vincent van Gogh mm -hmm. also suffered. And there are people like very artistic people. And there was a movie done with Matthew Perry in it, and it's called Numb. And that's a true story about, I think he was like a film director or producer or something in Hollywood that suffered from it. And Matthew Perry, Perry plays the part. And, and in, in that film, they say it seems to affect artistic types more than, than anything. So, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, how about any last stories about Dio? Did you ever, okay. So there was the initial Dio band that you sort of could have been a part of, but later on in his career, did you ever sort of meet up with him and say, hey, Ronnie, let's do something together? Was there any sort of... Or, oh, well, or in, in, in the book, um, I, I do get the call from, um, I think it was Wendy Dio I spoke to on the phone. I met up with her in LA and uh, uh, Ronnie's bass player at the time, I don't know if he left or he had or he got... Oh, you know, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so I did a three-week tour with Ronnie, but that was in 1998. Mm. And I went over and, and I rehearsed with Ronnie in LA and then in London. And then we did um, the Scandinavian tour. So there's no I magic think. after that, no magic to, to write together, to sort of, hey, well, Bob, come you know, over. 
<laughs> quite a new crazy train for me. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you know, we did discuss and I discussed it with Wendy about, you know, joining Ronnie, right, joining Dio, the band. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it just sort of, I don't know if he got his old bass player back or, or what happened, but um, I, I, it kind of fizzled out after that. But, the, you know, the three week tour was, it was um, musically enjoyable, but there didn't seem to be an awful lot of camaraderie in the band. It was. Um, it was a low time in the band, too. It was a, it was a very. Uh, what's that? It was a low time. You know, it wasn't like yes. their heyday. It was sort of like things were not going yeah. as well, right? Yeah. So yeah a lot yeah. of grumbling, probably, you know. Yeah. Well, Alan, unless you have another question, I will leave it with this. Yeah, no, just one last question. I just want to know yeah. if Bob's still still collecting jukeboxes. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> well, I, I wish I had a really, really good jukebox mechanic here in, in Australia. I had a couple of guys, and they both died. I mean, one was only 64, and he, and he had a seizure or something, and he died. And then there was another one. He was Swedish, and he was very good, and he got cancer and died. So, like, in, when I was in England... There was there was lots of really good jukebox mechanics, and and in America they're like everywhere. Uh, well, not everywhere, but they're you know <laughs> available. But here, it's um, it, it's not. I love the the old machines, but the thing is, you know, when I, I bought a a Wurlitzer ten fifteen in the eighties, nineteen forty six machine. So at that point, it would have been about. I don't know, 40 years old, but now that same machine is like, you know, 80 years old or, or whatever. So, you know, the older they get, the, the more maintenance and work they need or parts replacing. You can still get reissue replacement parts and that, but you need somebody that really knows their stuff and uh, they're not always available. But yes, I, I, I love them. Ever since I was a young kid, they fascinated me with the, you know, uh, 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 entertainment that's obviously for your ears because they play music, but to watch them, how they, you know, put the record on and they got <laughs> their change color and there's got bubbles and they're beautiful. I mean, they're a work of art. I, you know, I love them. Yeah. I remember, nice. I remember in the diners, those little portable ones, remember the diners, you press the button. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They're called wall boxes. Wall boxes. Wall go, box. yeah, as a kid, get, I was just putting noise. my money in there yeah. and just pressing yeah, all the yeah, buttons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. All right, that's it. So there you go. The trilogy is complete. For fact's sake, pick it up, <laughs> Bob Daisley, right. and 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 the introductions by Kelly Rhodes, which is beautiful. Kelly that's Rhodes, right. is a great person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a good lad. He's a great, great family. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Bob. Unless there's something you want to promote. Also, we should also say it again: Attack of the Witch, Metal Hall of Fame All Star Charity Song. It's on Bandcamp. You could pick it up there. Listen to Bob playing bass. Bob, is there anything else you want to promote? Well, I've just been doing uh, some some instrumental music with a friend of mine, Rob Grosser, here, who's who was the drummer of the Hoochie Coochie Men when we did the blue stuff with John Lord and and that and but, but rob um was uh, very um helpful for me to do the tribute to gary moore album i did the tribute to gary moore album called uh, more blues for gary um and um and, and the more blues for gary spelled m o r e so it was uh, you know obviously for gary and rob was on some of the tracks and he and and we put it all together and did the editing and together and that and then um we did some he had some instrumental ideas that i began playing on and then we started turning them into songs and um and we've called the new thing it's just really just me and rob the, the, there's a couple of um maybe one or two uh, guests on it there's somebody that does a nice slide solo on one of the tracks but it's kind of um it's a little bit like, oh, how would I describe it? Pink Floyd plays surfer music. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Pink Floyd goes to the beach, you know. <laughs> That'll be the name of the album. <laughs> I've had great comments. The feedback's been brilliant. Everybody I've played any of it to, they say, oh, I love this. One of the tracks is a little bit kind of like in the vein of Fleetwood Mac's, early Fleetwood Mac when they did Albatross, you know, with Peter Green and, and all it's got, it's got that sort of vibe, but but that's it's that sort of stuff, you know, very easy listening, uh, pleasant, and and everybody loves it. And we called it the upstarts, 
So okay. the upstarts is, um, uh, and and you should hear more about that by sort of early next year because it's oh, going to be. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I really like it. You know, I remember so you one feel, day you, I you feel chill, but you want to catch a wave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is a little bit, re- some of it's reminiscent of early 60s surfing stuff, yeah. but it's got a more mature, um, evolved uh, vibe of, of some sort of spacey, trippy, Pink Floydy sort of parts in some of them, which is, you know, it's, I really like it. I remember taking a, a disc of some of the tracks and sitting by the sea one day. After I went from Rob's studio and I just went and sat by the sea and put the disc on just to listen to, you know, by myself, just to, to relax and listen. I thought, wow, we've captured something here. This is good. I like this. And it really is. I, I really do like it. Can't wait to hear it. Yeah. Did you ever yeah, meet? Yeah, yeah. Did, did you ever meet Lemmy from Motorhead? Did he ever? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Did yeah, you guys yeah, ever yeah, talk yeah. about working yeah. together? And no. No. Well, he was a bass player too, so we couldn't really work. But writing together, you know, like. Uh, oh, I see. Um, didn't really. Uh, you know, we did cross paths. I remember seeing Lemmy on on one of the shows that I did with Ronnie Dio when when we did that Scandinavian tour. Uh, Motorhead was on some of those shows and. Uh, Right. Yeah, we, yeah, but but okay. no, I didn't didn't ever sort of hook up with Lemmy that way. All right, well, thank you so much once again, Bob. Thanks, Thanks for again. being on the show. We'll talk soon. You're Here's welcome, and thank you for the opportunity to 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 speak. And thanks for plugging the book and <laughs> a lot of plugs great. today. It's, it's, <laughs> it's definitely a must read for anybody who can get their hand. It's a hard to find book, but if you can get your hands on it, it's a great it on Amazon, Amazon UK, Amazon Australia, Amazon Canada, Amazon US. They they, they have it. It's, are you, uh, you going to write another book? Is there are there more memories <laughs> percolating there? Like you're saying, you know, I got to get them down. Well, I, well, the thing is, you, you usually when I get a new print run of that one, I just add to the epilogue and say this happened, that happened, this developed, and he died, she died, and whatever else. But but um, I don't know. Uh, there's been uh, there was some somebody suggested doing doing a um, a book for each of the albums, the, the biggest ones like Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman, the recording of just the, the technicalities and which is a possibility, I suppose, but um, I haven't done anything towards that yet. But Sounds like a Martin some... Popoff book, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Bob. Have yourself a wonderful Thank you very day. much, Bob. Oh, thank you. And all the best to you both. And, um, and everyone listening. All right. Bye. Stay well. Yep, you too. All the best. Thank Cheers. You.